course, is that our nation has constantly taken a positive step forward on the question of racial justice and racial equality. But over and over again, at the same time, it made certain backward steps. Well, the racial classification system that the government currently uses was born in the 17th century by slave owners in order to categorize and keep track of their property. Um, the system of racial classification was nurtured by Jim Crow segregation in the South. The government again misused these categories during World War II by interning Americans of Japanese descent. The entire system is invidious from the start. There are some places where they offer five boxes to check, some places where there's 14 boxes to check, some places where there's 26. Sometimes you can only check one. Sometimes you can check multiple boxes as the census, multiple boxes. So there's 63 different categories that the federal government recognizes. Um, so eventually this system will collapse of its own weight. The argument that most people uh, respond to is the issue of categorization and classification in and of itself. The, the phone calls, the emails, the people on the street, um, they resent having to check a box. They resent not fitting into a box. So at some point we have to say, is discrimination the most important thing that we have to address, or is it the, the, the consequences that flow from dividing our people according to race and ethnicity? And if we ever want to become a, quote, colorblind society, we have to start someplace. And I think it begins with our government. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. Congressman John Lewis is with us now. You risked your life for this night. How does it feel? Well, I must tell you, I, I, I feel very grateful that I'm still here to be here during this unbelievable historic moment in our country. This is, this is a day of Thanksgiving, a night of celebration, but I, don't, I just don't know how to express myself. Uh, it's unbelievable that we have come such a distance in such a short time to see a young African-American man elected president of the United States. I think it's the strongest possible message to all of our citizens and to the people of the world that we are prepared to create a truly multiracial democratic society. Congressman, if you can see your television screen, the Reverend Jesse Jackson with tears flowing, as I'm sure they have been for you as well, in Grant Park tonight. What does this say about America? Well, it's said that America is a, is a, is a different nation, a better nation. We are different people. We are a better people. We are prepared to lay down our dark past and look to a bright future. That in spite of all of our problems, we're prepared to come together and follow a man of hope, a man of vision that can take us to a place where we recognize and respect the dignity. congratulate you and the rest of the media on getting Obama elected. If your point is that perhaps Barack Obama is in for a new world order, I think you are correct. 
Mr. Huxley has recently returned from a conference where the discussion focused on the development of new techniques by which to control and direct human behavior. And through the application of physical coercion, through the appeal of ideologies, uh, through the manipulation of man's physical and social environment, and more recently through the uh, techniques, the cruder techniques of psychological conditioning. All revolutions have essentially aimed at changing uh, the environment in order to change the individual. If somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. Sooner or later, you have to bring in an element of persuasion, an element of, of getting people to consent to what is happening to them. We are in process of developing a whole series of techniques which uh, will enable the controlling oligarchy to get people actually to love their servitude. Uh, to all the young people who are here, I want you to, to know what I'm going to be asking for. I'm going to be asking for all of you to serve this country. To love their servitude. Serve in the military. People can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which they ought not to enjoy. Serve in the Peace Corps. Serve in the homeless shelter. The enjoyment of servitude. Serve in some capacity for your community. And that there seems to be a general movement uh, in the direction of this kind of ultimate revolution, this, this method of control uh, by which uh, people can be made to enjoy a state of affairs which by any decent standard they ought not to enjoy. Uh, this, I mean, the enjoyment of, uh, of servitude. I hope during these four parts of why some people can't see you've picked up on some of the seeds of the why portion. Listen to the languages that were spoken in the video footage, possibly some pictures that I displayed, or even some language during the verbiage in which I used. For me, I choose to love self. I choose to love humanity. I choose to love my culture that was lost, raped, and still today being bamboozled. But I don't let that bother me because I've risen through the ranks and learned what I needed to learn to move forward to assist those that are truly lost. My purpose is being fulfilled. Through the videos that I make is not to steer or misguide. It's basically my work of art, my work of expression. And if it enlightens someone and illuminate the true knowledge, then it's all worth it. But remember, think about it. Your neighbor, your family. Wonder why some people can't see. Till next time. Peace.